I'm Lisa Haysha. Welcome to the Legacy Interviews. Today I have Heather Carter with me. I love this woman. I met her about, God, what was it, Heather, 15 years ago? Maybe, maybe 20? More. Yeah, maybe <laughs> yeah. close to 20. Yeah, yeah, and I met her through a mutual friend, and she invited me over to meet this mysterious, mystical woman who does tarot reading, she does yoga, she does rituals, she's a mermaid. <laughs> she's so many things, and she's someone who I relate to as a soul sister because you can't put her in a box. She's someone who lives life every day for who she wants to be in the world, not what her job is, not what she does for a living or how she makes money or what the world thinks she should do. She every day wakes up and is just Heather and what does she want to do? How does she want to live her life? So let's learn a little bit from her. I know I'm interested. So Heather. <laughs> How are oh, you? I'm well. Honored to be here. Me always, too. Always honored to be in your presence. It was so wonderful having you here the other day with my six-year-old daughter as a mermaid. I mean, just doing that left the biggest impression on her and her friends. I mean, you changed lives that day. Aww. And you do that every day. Well, that was really sacred and special to me to be able to share that with Ava and just the journey that you were on to, you know, get Ava into your life. and. And just being a mermaid and having fun with kids is, is just the greatest joy. So much fun to just put on the tail and swim. So maybe we'll start there. What made you decide to get a tail and be a mermaid? Um, about, gosh, 1990, I was in a Las Vegas show called Splash that's no longer there. It was at the Riviera Hotel. I was hired to do another show and the show got canceled and so they threw me into Splash and I became what was called a swing so I learned everybody's parts in the show. And one day the girl that was the mermaid in the tank got sick and she was going to be out or she got injured for a couple weeks. So I was <clears throat> the likely candidate to go jump into the tank and I had never done anything like that. It was a very um, primitive tale speaking you know, as far as how they're made now but it was you know, um, crudely made, very heavy with no monofin and um, where there was a 10,000 gallon tank on stage. We had synchronized swimmers and divers. In the very beginning of the show, they pumped music into the tank and I would swim. So I had to learn from the synchronized swimmer how to use a nose plug and how to do mermaid tricks. And I actually fell in love with the, the, the role and the position and I actually asked them if I could just continue on doing it and the girl who had been doing it was happy to hand over the tail to me, pass the tail. So. I ended up doing that for over a year and during the course of that experience I always said if you know one day I would like to take this out into the ocean and swim in the cetaceans with the whales and the dolphins and have that experience so it wasn't until close to my 50th birthday which was this year a um, couple years ago actually that I put into motion creating that that dream to come to manifest so I ordered a tail from a woman in Florida and I custom designed it the colors and the specifications and it was a long waiting process over um, a year and three months, but very expensive actually. Wow. <laughs> but I got it and so now I take it out into the ocean and have experiences with the, the beans out in the water and I'm able to um, swim onto shore and meet with the children on the beach and they think that I'm a real mermaid, which is just lovely to carry on the delight and the magic and the mystery. Yeah, I love seeing your Facebook posts. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. That's when my daughter saw him and said, I have to meet this woman. Oh, so, so much fun. Yeah, that's wonderful. So what does that do for you, swimming with the whales and dolphins? For me, um, I haven't actually, well, that's not true. I have gotten close to a whale in the water. It's an incredible experience that cannot be described. It's yeah. very cellular in the sense that, um, you know, when you go underwater, when I swim, I can hear I can hear them, the whales and the dolphins, when I'm close to them, if they're nearby. And there's just something cellularly that happens to my body, and it just responds with such elation and joy. And I just want to get closer. It's like their family. I feel like mm. that's my family. And sharks too, correct? You sharks, I've, I've never swam with sharks. I haven't, I should say, yet. But I am definitely intrigued. I'm not afraid of sharks. I think they get a bad rap and I think that they're actually very innately docile creatures. I just think they're, they respond to fear 
And so when people are in fear or if they're mistaken for something else, they tend to attack. But I'm not worried about that happening to me. So that's just my feeling. <laughs> yeah. So how would you describe you? Oh, uh, I would say I'm a gypsy, wanderlust, um, hippie, um, explorer, life, soul and life explorer. That would be the way I would describe myself. Okay, and how did you get to that point in your life where you said, I'm going to take the fork in the road, I'm going to go down this hippie road, and I'm not going to do corporate America, I'm not going to do what the norm does. And how did you do that and feel safe while doing it? For anyone out there who says, God, I don't want to get a real job, I don't want a nine to five, mm. I don't, especially millennials today, I read a lot about that, and they're saying that they want to they're really worried more about their legacy than past generations. They want to go explore the world, learn languages, and mm. live life differently instead of working hard to earn a million dollars and buy a house. So what are your thoughts on that? Because you kind of went in that direction of saying, I'd rather explore and have experiences than work my whole life to buy a house and then to have all the problems and drama with it. I think it's, I can't ever remember being a tra drawn or attracted to the corporate world. Even when I was a child, I was very adventurous. I always imagined I was a fairy or I would just envision myself. I would read National Geographic and imagine myself in other, you know, countries. And my mom was very, very much instilled that independence in me and that, you know, the fact that my parents were divorced at such a young age and I was taking care of my younger brother because my older brother and sister weren't around, I was forced into independence very quickly in life. And I think when I came about 16 years old and I started studying more spiritual things, um, I've been having spiritual experiences since I was really, since I ever, since I can remember. Um, I just started on that path and I never was afraid or worried or it just was innate inside of me that there was more to life than just going to work and die, you know, having a family, you know, having a house and getting the picket fence and all of that. It's just, it was never in the cards for me. I've never had a straight job. Yes. I've only ever done waitressing or nannying because it got me a place to live in a car and food on the table and it gave me some sense of independence. Um, and then I worked as a professional dancer and then now I'm working as a personal assistant and I teach yoga. So anything that I do in reading tarot cards, I'm able to go anywhere in the world and do that. And that's pretty much what I've done. And I've been blessed. And I, I also traveled when there was no euro, when it was just, you know, when things were economically different. And so um, the dollar went a long way back when I was traveling. And so when I was backpacking across Europe and all that. Yeah, but you didn't need much. You didn't say, I need to listen to my voice. <clears throat> you, you didn't need to say, I need $10,000 to go to Europe, which is how a lot of people think. I don't have enough money and they save, but I was similar to you. I went to Europe on $1,000 for three weeks and it was like, okay. Yeah. I don't even think it was 1000 I think it was 800 Yeah, it's very doable. I mean, like, I, moved, that's okay. I moved to Africa. I just sold my car and sold most of my possessions and moved to Africa and bought a one-way ticket. I never thought I would actually come back to America, and I had no idea what I was going to do when I got there. It wasn't until the day before I got there that I actually knew where I was even going to stay. In what part of Africa? I lived in Senegal, West Africa. And what drew you to Senegal? I was studying the dance and the drumming from that part of the country, and, or that part of the continent, and um, I was so intrigued, and I always knew that I wanted to go to Africa since I was a child, so I went there How to study dance. You? I had just turned 30. so. Right, and my Saturn you, return. <laughs> where were you in your life at that time? I what had no, no marriage, no kids. I had been a professional dancer. I'd been working, you know, as a server. And I thought, why not? Why not now? And I remember having a conversation with my older, um, my dad's older brother, my Uncle John, who's kind of a, you know, was an actor and very successful in his life. And he said to me, he sat me down before I moved there and he was crying and he said, you know, what you're doing is so courageous and brave. I've always wanted to do what you're doing, and I never did. So I'm so glad that you're doing that. And, he, and, and I realized at that moment, for me, it was no big deal. It was like, oh, yeah, this is just what you do. But there are a lot of people that have, want to do that but are afraid to. Yes. To take that leap and that trust and that sense of adventure. 
And that was West Africa. I was told that taking my daughter to Spain to move there for a year. Oh my God, that's so courageous. I'm like, Spain. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> what happens in Spain besides courageous? really good food and beautiful dancing? What is courageous about? And don't they have great boots? <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> great shopping. Yeah, but I think there's an innate fear of leaving what you know. Your home, your roots, your friends, your food, your language, mm. your currency, and just being placed into a country where everything's unfamiliar, which it is. In the first couple of months, it was like, you know, OMG moments constantly. Yeah. About how do you get through this and how do I deal with that? But that's the adventure and that's the fun and that's what makes you grow as a person. That so, is life. That is yeah. life. So what would you tell someone or how would you, I don't you want to say encourage, but maybe inspire someone who does have aspirations for travel that is really scared, especially today, to go travel and follow their dreams? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that truly helped me younger, when I was younger is I studied martial arts and I got a real sense of confidence from that training because you know the, the whole idea of, of self-defense in martial arts is defending w w against oneself. So you're really confronting your own fears and your own worries about how you're going to be able to handle combat. So I feel like I had that kind of martial arts sensibility and, and, and a level of awareness and consciousness when I travel that I'm not just an open book that can be, you know, somebody can come and rip me off and things like that. I've had those things happen to me. I had that happen to me in Africa where somebody tried to steal my stuff. I actually ran, ran and chased the guy down and tackled him on the ground. I and cannot got my bag. see you doing that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I cannot see you doing that. <laughs> I had, yeah, yeah I, I did because it was just what was going on. I was, I went into survival yeah. mode. But that said, I mean, that probably wasn't the wisest thing to do. Yeah. I do think that it does take a special kind of personality, but you just have to trust your intuition. And I think a lot of people are afraid to use their inner heart and their inner intuition to do things. And the impetus for doing things is, is based out of security and fear as opposed to adventure and soul. So that I would say to explore a person's soul and adventure and have the trust within yeah. themselves to create, you know, protection. And don't put yourself in stupid situations too. You know what I mean? Like I remember I traveled, um, when I was traveling through Italy, <clears throat> my backpack was so heavy and I was running and I missed the train and I thought, oh, it was like the end of the world. And then I ended up meeting with these people and having this amazing meal and, and having this, you know, connect that I would never have had. And that was just, you know, so I didn't have the, oh my gosh, I had to have gone on that train and I had to get there then. I think that if you can just be open to what life, ex you know, hands us as we're having that experience, then it can be really fruitful and amazing. Yes, and I think what you're trying to say also is just knowing you so well and knowing how I travel. And my six-year-old daughter, you know, she's going to a new school and I said, are you scared? She goes, why? I get to meet all the friends that I have never met. And I think that's how we travel. I don't go there. I'm not afraid of the people. I go there to say, I can't wait to meet my soul family or people that are going to inspire me or that I'm going to learn from or I could share with them and mm. for an adventure. So if people open up their mind that these aren't our enemies that you're going in there and you're not, it's not you against them. Exactly. Yes. And yeah. it's just something, an experience to really sink into and explore. And some woman, um, elderly woman in Iraq told me, um, I don't know if I can remember how she said it, but she said, please, anytime you travel, think about what you can give a country instead of what you take from a country. Oh, beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? I love that. Yeah, and she said that to me in like in the early 90s, and since then I always thought, anytime I take a trip, what am I bringing to this country? Mm. Who am I and how am I representing the United States and what am I bringing? So I always bring like a half a suitcase filled with like stuff, especially we yeah. have Hollywood here, little Hollywood t-shirts, pencils, something. Exactly. And give it to people and, or medicine for kids if you're going to a developing mm. country. Yeah, and I think too, I, there was an experience that I had when I was living in Senegal that really, really brought home the idea of how small the world is. I went out into a village and I was, we, we took a, what did they call a car repi, which is just this big metal kind of truck that doesn't have any seat belts. And there was 
pigs on top with their legs tied together and they were dropping people off at different villages and we went to this, this village way out in the bush and we slept on the, the concrete ground in this, in this village and <clears throat> at the night time we went out for a walk with some kids who lived in the village who had never left the village. They were born and raised there and we were walking around and I said to them in their language, I s the moon was full and it was just so bright you could see everything. It was almost like daylight because the moon was so full. I said, wow, look at the moon, doesn't it look so beautiful? And, and the guy said to me, wow, you have the moon where you live? And, he's, and I said, yeah, and he said, oh, so the sun shines where you live? And I just realized how that, that moment in life really made me realize, you know, this is, there's so much more happening in life. Like this person never thought that the sun shone anywhere else other than where he was. Couldn't imagine because he doesn't have any idea how far away I live because he's never left. He's never left yes. maybe a few miles from where he was born and raised. And that type of thing um, really just brought home how small the world is and how amazing life can be with those kinds of experiences, you know? Yes, what's the most interesting or life-changing experience you've had so far? Mm, I would say that would be one of them. Um, I also was, was in Senegal for about nine months, and this was before the internet was happening, and I went out to um, take a ferry to Gore Island, which is where they sold the slaves in West Africa, one of the places where they sold the slaves. This is very beautiful, peaceful, artistic island that these people live on. They're very nomadic. Um, and I went out and, and saw the place where they sold the slaves and hung out with some people who had lived on the island, you know, pretty much for the last 80 and 90 years, an elderly lady that was a grandmother of a friend of mine that I knew from France. And that was really, really profound. And it was in that moment that I realized that I hadn't talked to my mom in nine months since I had re been to Senegal. Mm. So I called her on the phone and had a conversation with her about that when I was on the island of Gore, and that was pretty, pretty profound. Oh, absolutely. Right now I'm reading a lot on the internet. It seems like a big conversation is about women, and are you a woman if you haven't been married or have kids? And what is the thing about mm, that? Yeah, interesting. especially Jennifer Aniston's getting a lot of that. Oh, yeah. I think she just turned 45 or her movie Cake's coming at something. And so this debate came up and dialogue started really strong. What are your thoughts on being a mother or a wife or the, a woman's role in this world? Because so many women take such a different route, which we both have. And you know, even your thoughts on marriage and what marriage looks like or should look like. Mm. For everyone out there, I know the younger generation, they're getting married later. A lot of them don't want kids. A lot of them just want those houses that are like trailers made into houses where they can move around and travel. And what are your thoughts on what and how the next generation or us needs to live life? I think it's fascinating. I, I, I I feel a, a, a bit of sadness in this coming generation about how um, oops, sorry, difficult it is to um, find a job where you can get enough pay to yes. live and sustain yourself in this world. It's not like it, how it was when we were alive, you know, when we were growing up, excuse me, and how the difference in, in generations and how the, the generation now is addicted to their phones and they're very much stimulated into what I call AI, which is artificial intelligence with computers and phones and all this distraction this, uh, where you don't have as much human and eye contact as you did. And I think for women especially, there's this, this kind of stigma like you have to be successful and there's almost this maleizing or um, kind of you know, turning women into men you know, through this strength, in other words, and then there's this other group of women that are standing strong in their sovereignty, and I think that's really beautiful, and that's kind of how I see myself, is a very strong, I'm, I'm my, my uh, fiance calls me wild and untamed, but, you know, he, he knows that at any given moment I could just go run away, but I wouldn't do that, but there's, he appreciates that aspect of me, he's not afraid of it, I've got a lot of that in me. Yeah, I know you do, sister. <laughs> My husband says the same thing. Are we good still? I know, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Exactly. You know? 
But and I think that and on the in going into the marriage thing that goes into it because I mean I was married once before and divorced and my current person is married and divorced and we have we have no sense of urgency to do that because we've been together for nine years we are very content living together that way. Um, what do you think the difference is of being married and not married and do you think it's important? I for me personally it's not important to me. I feel very secure in the relationship. I feel like uh, actions speak louder than words. So the words that you would recite in vows, I mean, I feel like there could be a commitment, a level of commitment, but I know that that's there for us, for he and I. I just don't think it's necessary. But if People it, say marriage is necessary. Some people say that because it makes you have a stronger commitment, which I just don't think is true with what... Everyone I know is divorced, so where's the stronger commitment? <laughs> I, yeah, and I think so. people just, yeah, they just yeah. get married and divorce as if it was just, you know, anything yes. else that they were going to do throughout the day. Whereas people who, and I think it's individual. Some people really need and want that commitment and want to have the party and do the whole thing. I never really did that even in my first marriage, and I have absolutely no desire to do that if we decide to, to actually take that route. I just think it's a waste of money and time. Personally, I would rather have a honey fund and go on a great honeymoon and just share in a different experience and have that life experience as opposed to throwing a party and spending all this money and all that. And I think that marriage, you know, it's like Dennis Miller says, marriage makes, makes two people one. The question is which one, you know? Mm. So I think not, lose, not losing ourselves to the other person and to actually stay intact and whole and sovereign and autonomous and being autonomous is not subscribing to what the world is doing, which is how I feel like I lead my life. But what are you saying, actually? A lot of people would argue that you have to blend as one to make a strong marriage or a family. Well, I think if you have two individuals that retain their individuality and then you come together, but it depends on the scenario because, like, for example, we don't have kids. He has kids from a previous marriage, so we all coexist. And that's a different experience than raising a family and having that. But, but the commitment and the unity is there. It doesn't. I don't need the piece of paper or the ceremony to feel that, that unity and that commitment and the merging that we have. Yeah, I think it's very individual. But I certainly don't think we need that today, especially the way our world is going. I think it's more about the commitment. And I like being autonomous. I think two people who are strong individuals together have a better chance of staying together compared to one really needing the other and getting married for that safety. Yeah, and, and like I said, some women actually really, they really want that and need that. And that's perfectly... And some men too. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that's perfectly fine. I think that it's just a complete case-by-case -case scenario. It's not black and white or absolute for everybody. That's just my feeling. And what's your thoughts on parenting, motherhood? Hmm. Well, I, it didn't happen for me this lifetime. So I have taken care of a lot of kids because I was a nanny earlier on in my life and I have a lot of experience working with children. I think that being a mother is the most underrated job on the planet. I think that mothers are a rare and special breed. Um, having to nurture and take care of you know, little people and raise them and, you know, knowing my mom having to do it pretty much by herself is, it's a really difficult thing. And, you know, I have a, a deep respect and reverence for mothers and mothering. And how is that different from around the world? Did you see that documentary, Babies? No, I didn't. It's amazing. It shows kids growing up in like five different countries, different and parenting. Had, yeah. <laughs> Takes you all around the world. Well, I know from living other countries, like yes. in Japan and um, in Africa, how, how different kids are treated and raised compared to here. I think, especially now, kids are very spoiled in our society. I think, especially in Los Angeles, where we live. Um, not all kids, but a lot of kids. I think there's a difference between spoiled and being free and giving freedom and space because I really believe that kids need freedom and space I do too. to grow and to have their own experience. Um, and then there's other kids who just pretty much get whatever they want and get away with whatever they want with no sense of um, what my mother would call manners or you know, treating people with respect and dignity and kindness, which I think is just innate human nature. That's what I feel is a beautiful thing about being human. So, um, 
it, you know, again, I don't have that firsthand personal experience. So it's, it's, I have just, it from your travels around the world, mm. watching how different families raise kids <laughs> or just families, uh, how families live. You know, like Japan, the woman usually never works and stays home and the husband brings home the money and, you know, all these different dynamics from Africa where the men go out and hunt and gatherers, but they're more communal. Yeah. They all stick together, all the mothers with all their kids stick together and raise all the kids together and um, where else, uh, Europe. It's usually two kids, one or two kids, not much more than that, and both parents work. And There's a lot more independence, I think, from the kids that I saw from other countries. They were just much more fiercely independent and more self-reliant mm -hmm. than they are. I think there's a lot of, you know, especially having been a nanny in Hollywood, um, you know, planning this and planning that for the kids and, you know, taking them yes. here and going to classes and, and all these so things. so much more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> Went to Morocco, no one wears seat belts. Kids are barefoot. They're playing in the yard. They go to each other's house. They know all the neighbors. And here yeah. it's just like, can she even go across the street? What's, who's that neighbor? Who's this? And well, is it safe? And, and where we live, where I live now actually, is very much like how I grew up, where the kids all play with each other. They go to each other's oh, homes. They don't wonderful. wear shoes. You know, they eat at each other's houses, they go down to the beach together, they go play at the playground together, they ride their bikes and their skateboards, there's no, um, but it's not all like that, obviously, in other parts of, of Los Angeles, but especially in Africa, I mean, kids were just, they played together and were so much more independent. Without computers and iPhones all day. So and they were, healthier. yeah, and I think they, they spent a lot more time in nature, which I think is really lacking for kids in life you know, that's what I see. And I think that that actually for the human race is lacking really greatly, being outside in nature and taking that's your shoes off. you say that. I think that is the most profound thing a human being can do for themselves, just being in nature because it connects you to what's important. When you get really disconnected with concrete and cell phones and computers, I think your brain works differently and your heart is different and how you connect to others is completely different. 100%. Especially if you're watching the news and violent films all day and then going in, if you're a lawyer or something, arguing all day and then you And I think home. there's so much, you know, there's so much fear um, around, you know, life when you're just looking at the TV all day and listening to all the stuff that's happening. And it's, it's I think it's designed to do that, to be honest. I'm not, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna lie, I think it's perfectly frank. You know, the news and the media are designed to, to instill a lot of fear and control over people. Absolutely. And I think the more people step outside into nature and contemplate a tree or just, you know, go up and have a and connection with the corny, sun. sounds corny, but it's so true. <laughs> so I don't think go out and do it, whoever doesn't believe I don't believe think in it's this. corny at all. Yes. I think it's actually so real. It we've, is. we've completely lost touch with the cycles of the moon and the sun and the tides and you know when the tide is high our energy is high when the tides are low we're meant to be you know relaxing and we don't take naps like they do in other countries and cultures we don't take siestas which I think are just beautiful and genius I just living in Spain it's like wow we were sleeping now I could actually go home and not feel guilty exactly. it's like I take a nap if I feel like it or just read a book and well that's why they downtime. live so much longer yes you know yes there's yeah, I look at you as like mother earth <laughs> so I'm well, asking you some of these questions because you're so connected oh, to earth and nature. I, I appreciate that. I, I really spend my days in gratitude for Mother Earth and Father Son and the galactic core and all that's happening universally because there is so much more to life than what we see. That's just my personal feeling. What is there to life? Can you tell me three things that most people don't know that this what's important in life today? I would just go, you know, out on, out on a limb, as Shirley MacLaine would do, to say that, um, who happens to be someone I've had some connection with, which is really awesome, if you can look up at the sky and look up at the stars and think that we're all alone in this universe, I mean, to me, that is the most absurd thing on the, to think, is that we are all alone and that we're just, here we are and we're, that's all there is. And I think that a lot of people have a lot of fear about what that, you know, can bring into play. But I think if you can just look up and just contemplate what is out there, that alone could be transformative for people. Um, I also think that, you know, talking to nature and talking to animals and to the trees, and I think that there's a, this, this idea that people want to save the world and save the planet and save the animals and do all these things, 
I wonder if people actually talk to the bees and ask them why are they dying instead of just assuming that we need the bees to live and that therefore we need to figure out how to save them. Maybe they're going extinct because that's just what they're going to do. I mean, that's been happening for millions of years. Animals have come onto planet and then they've become extinct and moved on and another species has come in. So I think there's a lot of arrogance in humanity, unfortunately, with the right intention, with a beautiful intention. But if people will connect more with nature on a one-to-one -one personal level, I think so much can be learned through, through that exchange and if for the person who's having the experience and for the, for the being on the other end, whatever that be, whether that be a rock, and every inanimate object to me is a living thing. We're all living things. There is nothing that is, that is not living and it doesn't have a soul and doesn't have a spirit. That's just my personal feeling. I've never heard that perspective on bees before. Mm, I know people will be though. upset with me about saying that. Well, because I think, you know, even the situation with the whales and all of that, I mean, there's... The rhinos, there's five left apparently in the world, white rhinos. Exactly. And then, you know, there's all this attempt to, to make it stay. Well, has anybody ever talked to the rhino? And there's this beautiful woman, oh goodness. Um, uh, I'm, if I don't remember her name before the end of this interview, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you later. She is an animal communicator, and she communicates with animals very clearly. Um, Anna Brecklin, I think her last name is. She's from South Africa. And she has a very strong connection with the animal kingdom and speaks with them intuitively. And she's had, she's very much confirms what I have feel and have said. And, and I think that that's really important for people to have that awareness and just at least be open to the idea and, and take, take that into consideration. Oh, absolutely. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, I would say somebody told me that things are not always how they appear to be. And I would say that is the most profound, if, the, if people can contemplate that statement, that can be very, very transformative. And transcending, which, you know, transcending is a really interesting word because for me it represents ending the trance. You know, and there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of trance that's going on planetarily with the people and how they're feeling and how they're believing and what they're putting their energy and feeling into or they're not or they're just believing what they be hear mm -hmm. and I think if people can get more in touch that's my feeling with ending the trance of being controlled with their minds and their hearts and just being sovereign and autonomous and free and doing what they want to do instead of what society tells us we have to do or you know you have to do this like especially the the picket fence and the how you know the my mom was never that kind of mom she never encouraged that or and I'm so grateful for that and even my father who they were separated and divorced but he's very independent so it's it's kind of a miraculous thing to have that awareness yeah how would you advise someone or inspire is probably a better word to do exactly what you said, to be autonomous and to really take the time to figure out who they are. I know when I was younger, we were both, I think, did it naturally. I thought, I don't want to do the job and get married, the kids, regret the kids because I never got to live my life, didn't have a childhood, suffer with the kids because you don't have the money, you don't have this, you don't yeah, have that. The they get circle. divorced at 40, <laughs> then struggle some more, then your kids hate you, they go off to college, and I just saw this like in movies and in reality, I'm like, no way, I'm going to go with no money, I don't care, and travel through my 20s and 30s and go live life, and then maybe think about marriage or a family at 40, 45, because I thought at that age, 45, 50, people said I'm going to retire at 50 or 55. Everyone I knew at that age had all these health issues. Mm -hmm. So what, you get to retire when you're 55 and 60 and it's a completely different experience when you're younger and you get to take all those experiences with you your whole life, which is really part of the reason for traveling, in my opinion. And so you've lived that same life. How would you inspire someone? Everyone always says, how do you find a passion? or how did you have the courage or how did you break out of that mold because you're brainwashed like you're saying since you're this high this is what you have to do this is how you have to be and you have to get these grades go to these type of schools and 
work hard and get that intern job and, you know, work, you know, you can't even go to college now without working part time and volunteering and there's mm -hmm. so many rules and their whole life till 8 p.m., 9 p.m., they're studying school, studying, then you have to learn an instrument. You have to do this just to get into the right college that's going to work you to death to get that. My niece is in school in engineering at Davis and she's like, am I doing the right thing, Auntie Lisa? She's like, I'm working so hard, I'm getting like five, six hours a night's sleep because I have to intern and I have to study engineering and all this math. And she goes, when I graduate, they're going to place me in a job, move me to a place I don't want to live. I think they're thinking about Texas or another place. And she goes, I don't even want to move there. And I'm going to have to work 10 hours a day for yeah. the next 20, 25 years to... Otherwise, it's hard to get back in. If you quit, then go back in. She goes, I can't take time off to travel because then everyone else is going to take those jobs. So I'm like... <laughs> it's, it's a vicious circle. <laughs> Let's talk later. So, yeah. So what would you advise? Well, I think if people... If, if someone can, you know, quiet themselves down enough, which is for a lot of people is really hard to, to listen to the inner voice inside of them, that's wanting to be heard, but they're not quiet enough to hear what yes. they have to say. That's, that's when nature comes in. Exactly. Nature or just simply sitting with yourself and you don't have to turn the mind off and you don't have to do any kind of, you know, spiritual program or technique or, you know, meditation technique. It can just be simply contemplation. Just go inside into your heart and go. And also my body is a barometer and a gauge for me. If something doesn't feel good, my body will instantly respond. And if something feels appropriate and good for me, my body will respond in a positive way. So it's learning to listen to those whispers of, the, of not only your internal you know, energy system and your heart, but also your physical body. And so that's the first thing I would suggest for people and also just to know that you know it's not in everybody's genetic makeup to do the kinds of things that you and I do. Some people are just geared more towards doing those other types of living that other type of life, and I've really learned that that you can't change people that definitely have a path and a and a you know an idea of what they want to do. And I think it's it's unrealistic to think otherwise. It's kind of like saying everyone should have the same religion. Yes, you know that Absolutely. type of thing. So if somebody does have the impassioned awareness and wants to do it, then I would say go in and be quiet and listen to your inner voice and listen to your inner wisdom. And don't be afraid when something comes up that doesn't fit the mold of what you thought it was gonna be and go ahead and try it. And the worst that can happen is you, you it doesn't work out. Yes, you know? and then you learn a lot from it. And exactly. you can mark off something that you don't want instead of going, should have I done that or tried that? You know you did it and it wasn't right. And or the you other did thing, it and it took you in a good direction. The other thing, too, that I was just thinking about <clears throat> is that you, when you have an opportunity to have an experience you know, in life by doing something, if it's flowing, if, it's, if, it's, if the things are all just falling into place, that's usually a really good indication that it's the right way to go. If, things are, if you're getting met with obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, sometimes that can be a... a a way for you to be protected you know it has been for me in the past where I've thought that I wanted to go to this and that and the other and then it just hasn't happened and then other times I've innately know that something was going to occur and then everything was just fell into place the money showed up the situation and and from for the record all of my travels I had no money before wanting to do it I just manifested the money sometimes I got jobs sometimes the money was given to me um, I had just the complete and utter trust that it would happen. And that's, it's so hard for people to do. It can I be really difficult. Thing. It can be, but when you do it, you get so much more confidence in yourself too. Yeah. And then you can receive the gift of that experience, yes. even if somebody's giving it to you financially or is helping yes. you and assisting you. That is, that is a responsibility as our humanity to receive the gift of that. What a beautiful gift. It's like somebody gives you a gift and you want to slap it in their face by not receiving it. So that's really an interesting one for people too, is to really learn how to receive and take it in when it's happening and go, okay, wow, this is really happening. This is happening yes. so effortlessly. So if you're met with resistance, I think it's, it's sometimes either a protective thing or it's a way for you to learn a lesson. And if yes. it's just simply not happening, don't bark up that tree. Because I think that's... Yeah, don't push it. Yeah. Yes. Because something else will come. Maybe it won't be now. But, and I also think if you have expectations and you want it to happen in a certain time frame or whatever, it's like, 
so you take the time that it's not happening to have another experience yes. until that shows up. And that's so magical. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're at the end of this interview, too. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so what do you want your legacy to be? Uh, I've been thinking about that question ever since you, uh, you know, I was thinking about what to say. I really, if, if I'm only coming from my heart, I would say that, that I have been living my life the way that I wanted to live um, unapologetically and courageously without, uh, with an awareness of when I do pass that there is no death. For me, personally, that's just my feeling and that I'm going to consciously be aware and live my life until my body expires on this planet and do everything that I want to do. I love that, mm -hmm. setting each day as a conscious intention of what you want it to look like. Living the legacy mm -hmm. before you have to leave it behind as opposed to, and in a conscious and aware way. In fact, I was really thinking about writing out, you know, just moment to moment what I want my legacy to be from now on until the time that I leave this, this oh, planet. Oh, I love that. That's genius. I yeah. love your life and I Aww. love the way you live. And I, I love, love you. <laughs> you. I know. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Oh, I'm so honored. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm so grateful. And I Thank love you, you too, sister. Yeah.